What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the new now Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual Zoom studio with Matt Johnson. Now, before I introduce Matt, I just got to tell you guys that like Matt is like one of my closest buddies in the online space. Like he is the guy that built the Jay Campbell podcast. So it's a true honor to have him um, in my virtual studio today talking about his business, which by the way, uh, first off, Matt, what's going on, dude? How are you? Good, man. How are you? (laughs) Good to have you. So Matt is the author of an amazing book that literally just came out, what, in the last month, right? Yeah, February. Micro famous last month and a half. It's Groundhog Day. Sorry. So it's a lot. The last month is the last two and a half months, but amazing guy. He built his company, which is, I know as pursuing results, which is a literally a podcast company. He has been architecting his team. Of course, my podcast since Matt 2016, bro. Holy cow. Imagine that. Yeah, it's insane. Four years, bro. And, I, and I've box. known you since 20, I think I've known you since 2014. No, 2013. Was it really? 2013. When you, when you and I first met, it was in 2014 when you came up and hung out with me and Monica. We went to BJ's. Do you remember that? I do remember sure? that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, dude. So, so anyway, so guys, just real quick, Matt's bio. Um, first off, Matt is an incredibly knowledgeable, accomplished guy when it comes to the digital marketing space. Like, I literally go to him for advice and have for years now. Um, I always knew he was going to be an amazing guy. Like when he was just my rep, as he said, he used to work for a company called Viral Marketing. Shout outs to Frank Klesich. Uh, And of course, I have to say Scott, uh, who's no longer with Viral, just in case they end up watching this, which they will. (laughs) Um, But um, but he's just been, I knew he was a guy when I first met him, you know, way back then um, that was going to build his own niche as an entrepreneur. And he has done an amazing job. And again, his his book is called Microfamous. He has a Microfamous podcast please get his book. And if you're a podcaster and you're looking to grow, this is the guy and I'll, you know, we'll give him, give his information at the end of the podcast. But dude, as I always do on the Jay Campbell podcast, before we jump into the topics, which are going to be amazing, like how the hell did you get on this podcast talking to me today? (laughs) I'm still wondering that myself Uh, (laughs) because I don't know where this conversation is going to go, but based on our pre pre interview, who knows? We're going to have some fireworks, but yeah, I don't get a chance to talk about this stuff on my own shows because I have to keep it all business. So I don't know where this is going to go. We had a great conversation though, when you came on my show and we broke down like your brain, your personal brand, like how, like how you came to be micro famous in your niche, the advanced content that you give out. So guys, like I, like anyone that's listening to this podcast, I use you guys as an example of a super sharp, savvy, well-read, informed, educated audience. And to me, that's where most of the riches and the niches are right now is like niche potty podcast audiences like you guys that are listening, because you have the power to make people like Jay into niche thought leaders that run really successful, simple, profitable businesses and have a ball doing it, uh, serving a small focused audience. So I, so I love it. So they, see, that's, that's the thing about Matt. Like when I first met Matt, he has such a gift of the gab, like his word tracks. I mean, first off you speak at such a high level and you're also very high conscious. And I always knew that about you, even when I wasn't as high conscious as I am now today. So, I mean, again, it's a gift. I mean, obviously and you, you, you've maximized it. Um, But yeah, dude, this podcast is going to go all over the fucking place. (laughs) And I made Matt late on this podcast, unfortunately, today because my computer was self-installing. So we're going to we're going to go really surgical because he doesn't do long podcasts anyway. Um, His his words are so acerbic and so cutting. He doesn't need 45 minutes. But um, the topics that I have for you, obviously, that you sent to me were stages of influence, how to uncover clear and compelling ideas, building freedom of movement into your brand. And using podcasting new media to hit the tipping point of influence. That's great, Matt. But since you talk about that every day, (laughs) we're going to go, we're going to talk about Groundhog Day. Yes. Or whatever the F this world is that we are now in. And you and I were obviously already exchanging pleasantries off air. Give me your perspective of what the hell 
is going on on planet Earth right now? Hmm. Well, I, I live by an axiom that don't attribute malice to something that can be very easily explained by a combination of incompetence and opportunism. Okay. So I, one thing that I've noticed is that we have a potential to ascribe motives that may not be there mm -hmm. because people, governments, laboratories, you know, like there's a Aliens. lot that can be explained. Yeah, there's a lot that can be explained by incompetence <laughs> and then opportunism. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, really? so, somebody said it best. Um, it was another podcast host. He said, like, I, I get what the politicians get out of it. I get what the media gets out of it. Like uh, the incentives are clear. What does the ordinary person get out of buying into this? And that's, I have the same question. So I, I don't exactly know. I don't know what it's feeding. I, I know that there's, um, I, I do know this. It has become so politicized, and we can talk about why, why that is, but I think you probably agree with me on why it's politicized. That if you fall on one end of the political spectrum, you're going to believe one set of facts. If you fall on the other end, you're going to believe your own set of facts. It's the same facts. We're all looking at the same things. <laughs> on different directions. Now, a great, now, here's a great example of this. As, as we record this, we, the, we just came off the one weekend where California allowed their beaches to be open. And now they're There are photographs them. circulating. And people on the left can look at that photograph and be angry. And people on the right can look at the same photograph and go, eh, seems kind of sparse. People are social distancing. Right. It's the strangest, strangest right. thing. It's the same photograph. Right, right. right. So I think well, that's a little microcosm of what we're going through. No, I mean, you know, I'm, obviously I'm a big hermetic teachings person, the microcosm, the macrocosm. I mean, <clears throat> it's a law of balance. I mean, ultimately, whatever is going on right now, you're right. There's a million different directions we could go with it. Um, but, you know, economically, which as you and I are in the entrepreneur class and the entrepreneur space, and we talk to entrepreneurs every single day, and obviously all of us are now making our living purely off of this, right? I mean, what else can you really do right now? I mean, so many things are handcuffed, but what do you see, how is this going to shape our space moving forward, right? Because yeah. as you know, I mean, to me, it benefits you because you have a podcasting company. And I think a lot of people now are going to see the value of the spoken word digitally. Um, obviously now too, with social distancing with a bioweapon that will be circling the planet for two to three years, plus whatever comes out of it in the future, things are going to change, Matt. Like, you know, you and I were talking, but like I saw yesterday, like United artists, the theaters, the cinemas, they're done. Yeah. Nobody's going to go into a fucking cinema. Imagine the money that they have built on building those like really high-end niche IMAX and all this gadgetry CGI stuff that are now toast. So like, what do you think, how does our space evolve from this? Well, I am short-term pessimistic, long-term optimistic, because I think that the only, like we are part of this massive societal shift yeah. to the online space, to freelancing, to online consulting and things like that. Yep. And the only thing, the only thing that will stand in the way of that is the government trying to dig their heels in and set laws that keep us from doing the inevitable. But I, I think they're on the wrong side of history. And it, I, don't, I think in the end, it will not matter how many laws they pass, how many versions of AB5 they pass. Like we will find a way around it. Smart entrepreneurs are gonna figure out a way to run our businesses the way we want to run them. And if that means we have to start taking some of our staff out of certain states or even out of certain countries, which I can, you know what I'm saying? Like I could restructure my entire agency, fire all my US staff, sadly. Right. And I could go hire a bunch of people in the Philippines and, and South Africa, which I'm already prepared to do and still keep running my agency. And if I get forced to, I'll leave and I'll still make my money and I'll go live in a combination of Australia, Thailand, South Africa, and I'll bounce back and forth all around the world. To me, that's the future is the ability to be mobile, escape the governments that do dumb things or populations that agree with them. And you have to be, you have to have an income source that isn't tied to your location. And you have to have just a general overall mindset of I'm going to have to vote with my feet because the majority of people wherever I live are not going to agree with me. That's my perspective. I think you should be a politician, bro. You speak so <laughs> well. No, but seriously, like, I mean, obviously I'm a wordsmith myself, but like you just speak so eloquently and, and, and you always have in like the word tracks, but I, I kind of want to go deeper on that because obviously I think, I think exactly as you do. And, you know, Monica and I are already, we're planning our exit. 
No, you are. Now here, now here's the thing, and I haven't told you about this, but like I'll put my situation, and then you know we can kind of talk about. It. So, so you already just did a huge breakdown of my business. My business is growing right now. I, I, I have definitely, as you said, a short term deficit right now because a lot of people are losing their jobs and they're re reacclimating. But as I build my new website, get my coaching more dialed in, do some other things. I have a guy that I'll tell you off air. We'll talk another time. That's architecting a lot of my stuff now. I actually have a content marketing strategist, and I have a website SEO guy. They're doing all my stuff now, which are going to be amazing. So we'll talk about that. But, but um, to what you were just saying, so perfect example, and this is going to be good and resonate for people too on the show is that we want to leave and go to Flagstaff, Arizona right now. Cost of living, 5,600 foot elevation, you know, Flagstaff in between Sedona. So we can have our woo woo spirituality. You know, if we want to live in a nice suburb in Prescott, we can drive 45 minutes. We, so, so you sort of say we have everything there and then we have Arizona. We don't have California. You know, you can literally walk into right. a gun store and buy a fucking automatic weapon and they don't give a shit. Right. So you can literally live unpersecuted like you can't here in the people's Republic of California. Mm -hmm. But knowing what we know about the market, knowing as you and I were talking off air that the real estate market is about to capsize, mm -hmm. knowing the brand that I've built, right, for Agent to Care, which is, you know, no longer Monica Diaz team, we did everything to move and to sell, but it's like Monica is literally looking at no, no exaggeration, probably somewhere between, you know, conservatively 2 million to, you know, blue sky, three and a half to 4 million in lost commission income. Yeah. Of selling distressed merchandise over the next three years if we bounce from California. Okay. So that's obviously a lot of money. We don't need it, thankfully, now because of the stuff that I'm doing. But at the same time, Monica's like, well, maybe I should stay for three right. more years to cash out. You can, you know, have the house in Flagstaff and I'll live with so and so, you know, and fly up and see you for two weekends. So, so I'm giving that story because a lot of people are going to be, you know, in this type of situation, knowing what's coming from the restructure. Because I agree with you, we know that technology will allow us to blast off through this. But this, as you know, isn't even anywhere close to being readjusted yet. There's no acclimation. So anyway, I give you that scenario because like what you're, what you're capable of doing, you're, you and me are very similar. I don't even have the infrastructure that you have, but I have enough guys. I've got four people, but I can do the same thing. But it's like, you know, does Monica who's built her real estate from 30 years in the business, right? No. Just turn her back and reinvent herself, which she could, you know, with help from you. Sure. And obviously she could learn from me, but it's like, that, that's the decision a lot of people are going to be making because you're right, dude, the draconian states are making it impossible for entrepreneurs to not only make money, but just to be productive. Yeah. Yeah. And some, some, I think some people are going to go through that, that decision-making process. And, and if, if you're in Monica's case, and we'll talk about this more off the air, but if there really is two to 4 million in commission on the table over the next couple of years of selling distressed access, I mean, to me, that would be worth staying. Right. Because I don't know that there's going to be, I think the draconian stuff will lift at some point, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it'll get, it'll get to the point where you can live and be productive. But I do think if you have a locally based business, you absolutely need to be building capacity. Right. And, and even if it's just a mental mindset shift right. to shifting to where you're building a brand that can be, that can be portable. And if you're in, in a space where you can start learning how to generate and convert online leads, that is something that's picked up and relatively portable. Exactly. If you know how to generate real estate leads in LA, you know how to generate real estate leads in Flagstaff. She just, the thing is, you're hundred percent right, but she just was, I mean, and obviously I've been working her. She was this close to just saying, you know what? I want to be like you and Matt. I want to be an right. internet entrepreneur. I can do it. You know, I obviously I have the skills. I'm great on camera, blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, th this is kind of like just the wedge, you know, I mean, cause like we did everything, you know, this, we did everything to change everything in, in, in um, October through December of last year. You know, we changed the name, change the DBA, even have this now as a um, EXP satellite office approved in Southern California. And so we were either just going to take some money from our team and bounce, or we were going to potentially sell it. Now, obviously <laughs> this has changed a lot of things. I mean, you can't go to like another, you know, powerful, prominent team in this area and say, Hey, give us five or $600,000 now with everything so fucking destabilized. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's a weird thing, but you're right. I mean, you know, that's what Monica's been thinking because dude, in the last week, those 10 phone calls have come, Hey, I got to sell my house. Mm -hmm. Oh, well let's meet, let's talk about what it's worth. No, I don't think you understand. 
I got to sell my house and you got to find me a rental. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. that's coming because as you yeah. know, Matt, I saw this last night, 6 million people in California have lost their job in the last yeah. three weeks. Six Dude, I'm, I'm surprised it's not million higher. people. You, you know what I think is a good indication of that we don't have as many people working the rest of the time as we thought we did. Like we, we in the entrepreneur space assume that there, you know, there's 330 million people in the States. There's probably 250 million people working. I don't not think that, what is it? Half of that is it 150. Close. Yeah. So not I, the, the fact that we only have 20 million people unemployed right now and they haven't been able, like no businesses have been open for the past yeah. six weeks. Right. Tells you a lot about the fact that we've already been upside down for a long time. Exactly. Well, Morgan Stanley said this morning, and it was last night, but it was, you know, people reading it this morning that they expect 55 million will be the number by the end of May. 55 wow. million people have lost their jobs. So, but again, as you know, and you already said it, perspective is everything. Whenever there's, um, you know, it, an imbalance, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in real estate, you've been in the game, you know, long enough to know now, and obviously I've been in the game too long. Um, the, the imbalance is a massive opportunity for people. You know, the, the quote, when there's blood in the streets, yep. you know, and that's mm -hmm. what this is going to be. Now, again, we're not there yet, as I was telling you, that we're still having bidding wars. In California yeah. right now, I know, which is literally insanity because people have such little understanding and perspective. But as I also told you, they're more concerned about their rent payment, you know, because it's so absurdly high. So anyway, you know, and I think you know this, but you know, the best economic guys, and obviously they're just throwing darts at a board right now. <laughs> but they say straight up that the deflationary pressure that comes from this, because again, they're just printing fiat you know, recapitalizing whoever they can, not us, but the lower and the higher end, the high class, the high, the high super elite class and the low ends are being recapitalized and the entrepreneurs yep. are being stiffed. But yep. eventually it's going to cause massive deflation. And then you're going to have, you know, everything is just going to go out of control. So as I tell people, you know, and again, I was telling you this off air, Monica says to these people, look, your rent payment's going to come down just as house payments are going to come down, just as the housing prices are going to come down. But bro, again, instant gratification world, got to have it now, can't keep making this high rent payment, save my 20%, did all the things I'm supposed to do, except right. not have a market understanding or awareness that like tell you to know I got to wait a little longer. Shit, shit, you know, the tide changed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And we were talking about it before we hit record, just the, the question of, is it going to rebound? And there's people on both sides of the political spectrum that think that as soon as the light comes back on, that the economy will just come roaring back. Yeah. And I, I used to be in that camp, but there's going to be a lot of structural things. Like right. if this goes on any longer, it's one thing to pause for two weeks, right. but it's already gone long enough that we're going to not, we're going to not feel all these repercussions for another six to 12 months to even right. know what the repercussions are, let alone adjust to them. Right. And, and yeah, there's going to be, I think my greatest fear is that we reopen politically, but not culturally. Right, right. Right? That we reopen because the politicians are under pressure financially and from other right. ways, but culturally we still go, well, we need to do so so social distancing in restaurants. Like, really? You just committed every single restaurant that has ever opened to unprofitability. How exactly. long do you think that will last? Exactly. Restaurants are not built for social distancing. Exactly. Right? What about so you. Speaking of Vegas, right. have you seen the have you seen the company that's building the plastic things that sit on the table so that like each person has a space where they can breathe into but they can't connect to the really? person next to them? Oh, dude. Oh my God. We're, but, but are your, we building cones of silence? Bro, We're building everyone an point. individual cone of silence. To your point, we can't <laughs> even comprehend. I mean, I could laugh, but we can't even comprehend the complexities and the permutations of what is to come from the second and third order effects of this because we can barely even see the first order effects right now and well yeah and we don't know exactly how it's going to manifest in the u.s but we can look at other countries we can look at other countries that have gone through massive economic upheavals or even hyperinflation and the result is never good right <laughs> because culturally how they got into that mess is by going ever more status totalitarian and socialist and so the population is pushing it that way and so when something goes wrong the answer is never, oh, well, we should have been, we should have had more freedom this whole time. Right. The answer is, I, we didn't have my guy at the top of that giant power structure 
my guy would have done it differently and I would have been taken care of. So I'm going to get out to the ballot box and make sure that my guy gets in there. And so what you see is what we have in Venezuela, which is two socialists fighting over control right. of a now bankrupt socialist country. And nobody stops to think, hmm, I wonder if maybe socialism was the problem and not the person that just got voted in last. But that's what's so scary is, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a whole podcast. There are so yes, many is. young people, way younger than you, what are they called? Fucking Gen Z? Is that what they're called? They're called stupid. I don't know. I don't know what the generation is called. I stopped paying attention. You just had to say it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Stop. I did have to say it. They're not smart. Because as you know, bro, 90% of those people literally do vote for socialism, which is again, they absolutely do. a total lack of awareness of history. And as you know, our school systems have engineered history to be out. And as a history minor amongst, um, amongst four minors and one major, international relations, molecular biology, history, what was my other shit? Oh, nutrition, and then it was some other stupid shit. Oh, political science. I had four minors. Good God. I learned, I learned, you know, again, and, I, and I'm sure Churchill stole it from another, you know, ancient, but it was, you know, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past if you don't understand them, right? right. So it's like, yeah. that's what they've done. This horrific aspect of whatever the fuck they've done to our educational system is they've removed history. And so none of these kids, you know this, we've talked about this before, none of these kids even know anything before the 1990 Persian Gulf War. They know nothing, no. dude. Well, no, history is racist. So history, <laughs> history has an inconvenient habit of being racist, at least according to a huge chunk of the population. And, and here's the problem. My, my belief system on this is that we have lost that battle. Yes. You know, I, like, I think there's a lot of well-intentioned people that go, the answer is the Constitution. The answer is history. The answer is revisiting the founders. And the founders were great, but they made some massive mistakes yeah. that doomed them to, right. this, to, to being accused of racism and right. essentially allowed a group of people to invalidate everything they said because of some of the things they said and did. And that was right. their fault. Right. And because of that, I think we've lost that battle. To, to me, like, I don't even try, I don't hold right. up the Constitution. The Constitution has failed, in my opinion. Right. right. So, I, th so I, th I think from a marketing perspective, because I look at everything through that lens, I think that the progressive left, especially, not, not liberals in general, but the progressive left has had better PR and marketing for a hundred years. Right. And we're seeing the result of that. And the, and the people on the right and the libertarians have never, ever caught up. We've never understood how to market our ideas. Right. We still don't, and we're suffering the consequences. And I think we've just we've lost the battle with young young people, and now we have to like reset them and go. I don't care if you ever learn history. Like we have to start appealing to that inner sense of of a moral compass and right and wrong that the progressive left has been appealing to, and start getting them to think about things like freedom, the way that they started thinking about things like freedom in the 1700s, while right. all these po ideas were also unpopular. So we've been through this before and we can do it again, uh, but I don't think the, the answer is to go back to the past. The answer is we have to reset things and start fresh. Again, very good. You'd be a good politician, dude, but okay, but let me counter you because I agree 100%, obviously, I, there's no disagreement, but to reset is a strong word. I know. And, I know. and obviously I agree with you 100%, but let me just, to, 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 to jump on that group even further, they can't fucking handle the reset. Those motherfuckers can't even change your oil. They couldn't start a fire in the wilderness to feed themselves. Dude, if well, these, I do mean an these, ideological reset, a, a, mar, a reset things, in terms of marketing our, our ideas. Wait a minute, dude. It goes deeper than that, though. It really, yeah. really does because a reset only comes when people actually lack when they actually have to struggle, when they actually don't have everything at their fingertips instantaneously like they've always grown up in. And that entire generation, that class, doesn't matter the people, doesn't matter their political bent, doesn't matter really anything. They have always had enough, if not more. Mm -hmm. And so how are you going to reset their expectations and their reality? Because they think socialism works. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to not know it doesn't work unless they feel it doesn't work. It's like Monica always says, you know, you can left brain somebody, you know, you and I are smart. We read where we learn, but until you feel and you experience against the heart, mm -hmm. there's no way. So, you know, that's maybe what we need, bro. Maybe what we need. And I'm not saying like the end, I'm saying a fucking depression. 
Well, I mean, this is interesting. This time that we're living in, and that's why I'm cautiously optimistic because there are a lot of people that are sleeping, as you've mentioned. Yeah. But there are a lot of people, and I don't, I don't know how you know to put it in percentage terms. But there's a lot of people that are looking around, going, "This is not what I had in mind <laughs> when I voted for Gavin Newsom or any of these yahoos that are in office." Right? Like I expected. Like people vote for things like this on the mental basis that I pay the same amount in taxes and get more back in stuff. When they start realizing that it can't, the government can't deliver on that and they start feeling it in their daily lives, and then they feel the politicians dig their heels in and start becoming the fun police. Like that's why, I think that's a big part of why Ron Paul got popular in 08, is he said, look at this one issue of pot. Do you agree with that? And everybody went, well, no, this doesn't make any sense. He said, well, look at the left. Well, they're against it. Well, look at the right. Well, they're against it. Are you against it? No, this makes no sense. We should be able to free, we should be free to put whatever dumb things I want in my body. And so he said, great. That's an example of a much greater principle. Okay, but that, that's a great comment, a great point, but this goes right back to our lack of historical narrative. If you fucking said Ron Paul to anyone under the age of 30, <laughs> it wouldn't I know, but I'm talking about why did his message work back then? I get then. it, dude, Ron I Paul. Get it, yeah. I get it, but I'm just saying, again, it's a lack of historical narrative. Okay, but, he did, but, but notice what he didn't do. He didn't go, marijuana used to be legal. Now let's go back to the 20s and figure out why, why it became illegal. Like he didn't try to give them a history lesson. He, he said, look inside yourself and see if this matches with your belief system. And they right. went, no, there's cognitive dissonance there. Like these two things, one of these two things is not like the other. They yeah. went, well, how can that be? How can you be super left, progressive, whatever, and also believe that I can't walk into a store and buy pot, but I can go buy cigarettes and alcohol? That right. doesn't make any sense. So he goes and he pushes on that thing he pushes on that cognitive dissonance and gets them to open up their belief system. And I think we can do the same thing, not by referencing the past, but, but just by finding those wedge issues and start poking at them. That's my, that's my. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a great point. Um, what we didn't talk about, and I do want to talk about some of your points real quick in the last 10 minutes here, but what we didn't talk about was technology yeah. and how technology has really lowered IQ. And that's, that's not me making stuff up. That's actually right. statistically buried now by Google. And again, you know, we were talking about like young kids, you know, in my house, um, you know, using this before they use their brains. But I, I but let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you were wanting to talk about today. And we'll just go surgical, but the three stages of influence. Okay. So three stages of influence, get seen, get noticed, get known. So you're at the point where you are known, right? You're right. known in your space. So you right. hit that tipping point. So the best way I can describe the three stages of influence is like, uh, pushing a rock up a hill. And there's actually an illustration of this in the book. So right. you push the rock up the hill, but at some point you hit the crest of that hill. That's the tipping point. And from that point, you're rolling downhill and you start to gain momentum. So what is that tipping point? And to me, it's when the market agrees with you that you are known for the thing that you wanted to become known for, your clear and compelling idea in most cases, right? Um, and to me, that's when things start to get easier. It starts to get take on momentum and a life of its own. So like moving into the future, all these people that are kind of getting into the freelance space, they're right. about to be thrown into a world that's wildly confusing to them. Right. Because for most people that, that have been sleeping this whole time, they've been insulated from the fact that 80% of what they do every day produces no or negative results. Exactly. Classic 80-20 rule stuff, which entrepreneurs tend to understand, but the average person thinks is a horrible injustice. <laughs> so they, they're going to get, you know what I'm saying? Victim mindset, yeah. Never mind the fact that that also applies to the size of the grains of sand on the beach right. and the distribution of stars. Like this is just a universal principle of the universe. Right. But people get into this and they don't realize that 80% of what you do all day doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's, the, it's those vital few things that move the needle, right? And so I think we're about to see a lot of people thrown into the freelance world that think that because they are well-intentioned and do a good job and they show up and they put their time in, and they're wildly confused when they can't go out, they can't support themselves, they can't make a living in this new economy. And they're going to have to figure out, they're going to have to get an education in the real world in how things actually work, which is that you got to do things that produce results, and then you sell the results. Beautiful. How does someone com um, find a clear and compelling idea? How does someone find that? Well, the, the response that you should get when you tell the type of person that you want to work with what you do in one to two sentences, the easiest way to tell if you have it is that they should say, holy cow, Right. I've got to, wow, I didn't even know that exactly. What, bro? Okay, what tell me more about that. 
Yeah. So five years ago when I was getting into what I did now, I mean, you, you knew it because you, like, you were one of those people. I, like I said, yeah, like we do, you know, like we basically run a podcast for you behind the scenes that you just show up and talk and we do everything else. You're like, uh, and uh, you know, like, wait a minute, I, that, that exists. That's a thing that, that, that that's that, you know, so I got that, that response. That's how I knew I had a clear and compelling idea. And every time I see somebody launch a podcast or start a freelance business or consulting or whatever, and they don't get that response from the right people, everything in their business is sluggish which means they got to hit the road and they got to do a million speaking engagements or they've got to do events or they got to show up at networking events and stuff just to get clients. And if that's what you have to do to get clients, it's going to be a rough life. And by the way, vacation. speaking and networking, but gone for the next year or two. Yeah. Something. I mean, well, unless, I mean unless you want to serve the, 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 the right, the, you know, the crowd on the right politically, they, they, that might come back sooner. Yeah, but oh, yeah. I mean, I just think with social, I don't mean to cut you off, but with social distancing, we know that that's all going to shift. That's all going to change. I mean, bro, the whole convention speaking circuit network is toast for 2020. I know. That's insane. It's all gone. And, and again, however it evolves, but this is good that you're talking about this and that we're very surgical on this because the point that you made up is very, very big. All these people, 55 million, according to Morgan Stanley, are going to be out of work. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're going to be out of work and it probably impending depression. Hopefully it's not a 14 year depression, like the last depression, but it's going to be a depression for probably a year to two. And hopefully it doesn't become stagflationary deflationary like Venezuela, which it could sadly Good. because of what they're doing right now, but we're not going to talk about that. But what do people who are, as you said, displaced, most likely being forced into this, what, how, how long should they give themselves before it's not going to work in your opinion. And you're the guy that gave them that opinion. Because again, as you said, a lot of people mm. have been in a cubicle and they've mm -hmm. been taking orders, even high ranking people with titles on their business cards mm -hmm. and they're older, right? Think of the 50 to 60 year old people that are going to be displaced from this, bro. Yeah. So what do you, as your professional opinion, as an actual very accomplished podcaster, entrepreneur, class warrior, assassin, whatever you are, what do you tell a person who's contemplating getting into this? Because it's really almost last resort. They have no other recourse right now. Like what is the edge that you tell them to say, this is not for you at a certain time. And are you talking about like how, how long to give it before they essentially give up on their, like the life they've had and start yes. moving on into other things. Yes. Uh, honestly, I wouldn't, I like this, this should be a massive wake up call that the security that you thought you had by being in that world was an <laughs> illusion to begin with. And you should be, you should be getting out of it now. Now that doesn't mean if, if things come back in six months and you get another job offer or something, or if your company just is in a niche where it's relatively unscathed, which there's, right. there's a, there'll be a few, Oh yeah. you know, if you're, if you're in hedge funds or something like that, yeah, there'll be some movement, but if you're good at what you do, there's a, there's a job for you. Yep. Uh, I talked to one of my friends who's in the aviation space. He's, he's an executive recruiter. And he said, look, if you can do the job of three people, if you can show in and show them how to grow the business, or if you can just cut costs, <laughs> if you can, right. Like their companies are looking for two people. You can make me money or you can save me money. If you right. can do one of both of those things, there's a job for you. Right. There's going to be a lot of movement, a lot of people left out, but you just got to make yourself indispensable and that, and that can be done. But if you want to make yourself indispensable to where you're not dependent on one person anymore at all, then jump on Facebook live and start sharing your expertise and take those very first few steps into building a personal brand for yourself. That's portable regardless of what company you work for now. So last point, and then you can share how people can work with you. And I definitely want you to tell people how they can work with you. Um, and obviously, you know, just to sing your praises, I mean, like I wouldn't work with anybody. As you know, you, you and I are very strong opinion guys, and we've had our back and forth over the years and stuff like that. But I just won't let you go, even though you want to fire me because you don't need me anymore. <laughs> Uh, I just, I just won't let you go because like your people are so well-trained and, you know, obviously there's, I'm speaking very esoteric, arcane, uh, medical jargon and whatnot, but anyway, using podcasting and new media to hit the tipping point of influence. So I got to ask you this, and I, I don't think I've ever asked you this. I laugh. Are there too many idiots with podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, dude, there's 900,000 podcasts out there. There's plenty of idiots. Yes. But here's the good news. Um, most, <laughs> most idiots believe if they create a, a big enough flurry of activity, right. That it will get them results. Now you talked about instant gratification. Yeah. Most of those idiots want instant gratification, which right. means their podcast isn't going to make it beyond month two or three. Right. So all you got to do as far as the idiots is just, you, you keep showing up. That's the easiest exactly. way to beat the idiots. No, that's absolutely true. So, so when you do, so when somebody calls you up and has no presence, 
at all. I mean, first off, will you take a person like that? Will you still build them out? Because you guys have a seamless system, yeah. or do you, do you? Do they have to be at a certain level of influence or a certain level of accomplishment online? No, I mean, we took, you know, when I first started working with Jeff Cohn, for example, in the real estate space, he had zero presence, zero social media of any kind. What he had was a clear and compelling idea. Right. I net seven figures a year off my real estate team and I only work half a day a week. Like, great. There that you is go. a clear Show and compelling that. idea. Yeah. yeah. So all we did was we launched this podcast and put him on other podcasts and because he had the right idea that spoke very deeply to the right audience. It, then he grew very quickly and now he has a multi six figure coaching consulting business that we built in a, about two years off the back awesome. of that podcast. So no, it's all, it's all about the idea. I love working with people who are, I call them emerging thought leaders, right? If you've been in this for 20, 30 years and now you're thinking about launching a podcast as just another way for people to get content. Like that's not even the right person for me anyway. I want the folks like you and Jeff Cohn and stuff like that, that like you're taking those first steps but you have this razor sharp, clear and compelling idea that speaks really deeply to a defined group of people because I can get you connected up with those people and make you micro famous if you have that, that idea. It doesn't matter what presence you have yet. I think I need to actually get you to sit down with Monica, even though you know she's fighting that little inner war right now because she does want to do this. And obviously, you know, Monica, I mean, she can charm anyone, you know, and she's, you know, with her book, you know, Cracking the Fountain of Youth Code, like it just, she has to figure out if she wants to be an online coach for women, which I think she would be absolutely amazing at. But as you know, she's just technically challenged, but it's like, you know, the guy, my content marketing guy, which I'll talk to you about there, told me the other day, he's like, Jay, as long as she can show up for 15 or 20 minutes a week for a live stream or a broadcast and be compelling on camera. You hire the right person. She doesn't need to do anything more else than that. And I was always kind of like, I guess I've just never hired the right person. Dude, you're the fucking man. I truly appreciate you coming on this podcast. If somebody watches this, they're going to get a lot of value because it's been awesome. And they want to talk to you about, you know, starting their own podcast. What's the best way for them to connect with you? So best way for that is just to go to pursuingresults.com if you're curious about the service. If you want to know about the strategy that will actually make a podcast work and get you 10x return on your, on your time and money that you spend to do it, then go get Microfamous Books. So that's at microfamousbook.com. And it's free plus shipping. So you cover the cost of the book I, or the shipping. I cover the cost of the book. Um, and yeah, we'll ship it to you for free. Dude, you're the man, man. I truly appreciate it. You guys, thank you guys so much for watching the show. And as always, support the amazing people that do come on. Like Matt, if you don't have a podcast, if you do have a podcast, look look his company up, pursuingresults.com. I mean, again, I sing their praises. And of course, buy his book. I mean, it's free. You just got to pay shipping. So remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys soon.